Chapter 13, Yellow Fever. During the spring of 1793, Ona's time was consumed with all of the social duties of the wife of the president and all of the domestic duties that came with slavery. Whatever her wishes and dreams, Ona could not publicly pursue them. Her life was bent and shaped by the Washington's will. Yet it was at this moment that the stowaways from the West Indies arrived. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are always a pain. This time, they were deadly. The mosquitoes didn't care what color a person's skin was. They just did what mosquitoes always do. Bite. Soon, men and women, black and white, old and young, rich and poor, began to get headaches. Then chills. Then fevers. Eventually, their, eventually their organs failed. Death became the norm. Yellow fever was sweeping through the city. Everyone suffered. No one figured out it was the mosquitoes that were carrying the disease. Thousands of citizens fled. George and Martha ordered Ona and her fellow servants and slaves to pack up the household for a retreat to Mount Vernon. These were the days before modern medicine was considered a stable science. There were some educated guesses and some new supernatural theories about the cause of the plague. Many people assumed that the sickness was called by stale or smelly air. There were no sewage systems in the 1790s, and summers in Philadelphia were notoriously hot. This did not help the afflicted people who were steaming from their fevers and vomiting from their infections. It wasn't until the first frost swept over Philadelphia in November that the mosquitoes died off. Between four and 5,000 white Philadelphians had died, as had 400 black residents. Tobias Lear's wife, Polly, was one of the dead. Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, Treasury, and Richard Allen, the preacher, had both caught the disease but had managed to survive. Ona was not in Philadelphia during the worst of the epidemic. She was with the rest of the household at Mount Vernon. If she had been there, she would have seen another example of how difficult it was to get white people and black people to live happily alongside one another. When the disease was striking everyone in its path, Dr. Benjamin Rush, the most well-known of the doctors in Philadelphia, came up with a hypothesis that people of African descent could not catch yellow fever. There was no basis for this theory since, indeed, many black men and, and women in Philadelphia had been killed by the disease. Perhaps the relatively small number of black deaths compared to the total number of people who died made this fact unknown to Dr. Rush. Whatever the reason, in September of 1793, Dr. Rush reached out to the leaders in the free black community, asking for their help as nurses and grave diggers. People were getting sick all over the place, and dead bodies were piling up and decomposing. The free black leaders Richard Allen and Absalom Jones heard Dr. Rush's plea, and they saw an opportunity to raise the status of free blacks in the city. If white people saw black men and women helping out during this horrible epidemic, these leaders reasoned, surely they would finally believe that this same community was worthy of freedom. Richard and Absalom also knew that people like Martha Washington had a stubborn belief in the negative stereotype of black people, that they were lazy, rebellious, and unreasonable. Richard and Absalom believed that helping out during the yellow fever epidemic was a chance to change their minds. They rushed to help and brought with them many other black citizens eager to pitch in. The entire effort was a catastrophe. Disease and death did not care what color skin a person had and struck blindly and mercilessly at everyone. Black people died of the disease at the same rate as white people. But just as black and white people were segregated in life, they were segregated in death. White bodies filled up white graves and black bodies filled up black graves at the same overwhelming pace. What was even worse was that during the panic of the disease, white people began to accuse black people of robbing dying men and looting abandoned homes. An opportunity to reduce racial tension between black and white Philadelphians was lost. Instead, the experience reminded free blacks, servants, and the enslaved that freedom, if and when it finally came, would not end years and years of racial violence, stereotypes, or wrongheaded hatred. When Ona returned to Philadelphia with the Washingtons in late 1793, she would have walked among the wreckage of the city, noticing more than just grief in the air. She would have sensed that relations between blacks and whites had become even more hostile than they'd been before she left. Soon she would hear firsthand how soul-crushing it was to be accused of such shameful behavior 
when the free black community had genuinely wanted to help. Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were more than aggrieved, they were furious. The same Matthew Carey who had published Description of a Slave Ship had printed a widely read pamphlet that accused black people of plundering white people's homes during the yellow fever epidemic. Richard and Absalom spent the next several months composing a response to Carey's destructive words. To those who keep slaves and approve the practice was printed in early 1794. In it, Richard campaigned not only for freedom for slaves, but for a stop to racial discrimination. Quote, if you love your children, if you love your country, if you love the God of love, clear your hands from slaves, burden not your children or your country with them. Even in Philadelphia, the place that would become the guiding star of the abolition movement, Richard's plea did not always work. For some white people, darker skin alone was reason to consider black people an inferior race. Even when black people offered up their lives to help whites, as they had during the yellow fever epidemic, they would still be rejected and scorned. This was a valuable lesson for the free black leaders like Richard, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, but it was also a reminder to owner herself that even if she somehow, some way, eventually claimed her freedom, it was not a ticket to an automatically easier life. Freedom did not erase racism. In fact, it could make racism worse. Ona persisted despite mounting despair. In December of 1794, she met with a personal tragedy. Austin, now in his mid-30s, was headed to see his wife Charlotte and their children at Mount Vernon. He often traveled alone during his, this journey from Philadelphia to Virginia and had always arrived at his destination safely. Not this time. Austin attempted to cross a river in Harford County, Maryland. It may have been a storm or a rushing current or something else altogether, but soon a letter arrived in Philadelphia stating that Austin was, quote, with great difficulty, dragged out of the water and was, quote, likely to lose his life. He died shortly thereafter. Ona was about 21 when she received even more des devastating news in January of 1791. Her mother, Betty, had died. She'd gotten sick in her late 50s, and after a lifetime of enslavement coupled with poor living conditions, particularly in the winter when cold air could come straight through the walls of the shabby slave cabins, meant that she was especially susceptible to illness. While George Washington may have been sympathetic, as a practical matter, Betty's death saved him money. It cost money to shelter and feed and clothe elderly slaves who could no longer work. With her death, Betty had saved George this expense. Ona had no reason to look at her loss practically. Betty was the only parent she had ever known. The death of Austin had been incredibly painful, and now her mother was gone. For Ona, it must have been one of the most crushing blows of her short life. Her trips to Mount Vernon would now be tinged with grief. Her life in Philadelphia was irrevocably changed as the branches of her own family tree had been lopped off abruptly, leaving her basically alone. Philadelphia had much to commend itself over Mount Vernon, but as freed preacher Richard Allen stated, slavery is a bitter, is a bitter pill. Every life has ups and downs. Every life experiences sorrow. Disease can strike anyone and death kills everyone. For slaves, for someone like Ona, living in the biggest city in the new country, the ups were never fully separated from fear. Every day, every second, Ona would have to worry that if she did something wrong, if she perhaps cried over the death of her mother, instead of immediately serving Martha her tea, she might be sent away, back to Mount Vernon or somewhere else. Worse yet, human nature was allowed no outlet in the emotional life of the enslaved. There was no acceptable place for the range of human emotions. If you were angry, you had to swallow your rage. If you were afraid, you had to pretend as if you were calm. If your mother and brother had died a month apart, you had to go to work without tears, without a break, without comfort. Like a robot, a slave's life was programmed. Service to your owners, sleep, service, sleep, service, repeat. The ups of a human life were limited to a trip to see a play if you were lucky, or an extra dress or pair of pants to wear, if you were lucky. A common law wife or husband, if you were lucky. Ona was not lucky, but she was smart and she was proud and she was brave. It turned out 
that when things got even worse for her, these character traits would be enough.